1 Corinthians. Say reread because we read it last week. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love them. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What do you look through? Okay, a telescope. Maybe a better question is, how do you see? Your eyes, right? And many of us have to look through a version of correctional lenses, right? Or if you want to see something that, say, is really far away, you need binoculars or a telescope or something, right? But we look through something, and last week as we read this passage, we're told to, as we seek wisdom and understanding from God, the lens of which we do that through is through the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that teaches us about the things of God. And so as we approach Scripture, as we approach understanding what, what heaven looks like and what we need to do, what our part in, in still being here until we get there... The Spirit is who teaches us. It's through that lens that we can understand Scripture and what it means to be here doing whatever it is we're called to do. Right? Because if you take the Bible and apply worldly wisdom and worldly understanding from its concepts, what do you get? You get what? Mud. Okay. Private interpretation, that's true. If we use someone else's understanding of what God has written, then the Spirit, we end up with something less than what God had intended. Yeah. Hang on a second. It's like that children's book where everybody's feeling a different part of the animal. Ah. Uh. You know, somebody's holding on to the tail and somebody's hanging something else. And, you know, depends on where you are in your steps of life, maybe, as to how you interpret or how you were raised or what lens it's giving to you in the first place. Indeed. Which is why it's, it is a loving thing. Sometimes it's a difficult thing to do. But when you see someone who is interpreting Scripture with any other lens than the Spirit... It's a loving thing to instruct them and help them learn what it means to interpret through the Spirit. Because if we, ever, if we only ever apply our own understanding or the worldly understanding of Scripture, we end up with a mess. Right? That's just, there's no other way to describe it. It's less than what God had intended. And that's what creation now is. What we see 
is less than what God had intended because of the fall. And it's the reason why God is continuing to do his work here of redemption. And he invites us as his ambassadors to be ministers of reconciliation. Because of all of this mess that's currently here. And it has to be done through the lens of the, of the Spirit. That's what, we, that's what we see in this passage. As you, as you go about your day, or maybe for some of us that, that... How many of us have Facebook on our phone? Anyone? Okay, for those of us who do have Facebook on the phone, what stops you? You're flinging along through Facebook, right? You're just zipping through there. What stops you to look? What makes you stop and look? Me? Okay. <laughs> yes, and that's what I'm asking. Like, it is you. That's fair. That's fair. When... When you have Facebook on your phone, I, th I believe they have designed it. They've intentionally designed Facebook on your phone to addict you. Right? It's based on what you're looking at and what you see on your phone. Yeah. It's going to continuously, th they have a, uh, an algorithm that ciphers through what you typically stop at and look at. So that they can put more of that there. Because they want to keep you on Facebook longer. Right? The whole reason for this is so that they can stick more ads in front of you. Right? It's ridiculous. And some of you are looking at me like, this is the most ridiculous thing I've heard of. Because you don't do this. And that's good. It's not an unhealthy practice to only look at Facebook occasionally or to never look at it at all. That's not unhealthy. Okay. There are people in this world, though, that they, they spend a lot of time on Facebook, and they will zing through. And it's just like, um, just like a scroll where you, you, you twist it on the top, and more keeps going. You know, or like the, the when I got into the, games, you know, it was like uh, Mario Brothers on the TV, that it all, it, it all scrolled, right? It, it all just... There was none of this, like, you could turn every direction and go all sorts of ways. It was like this. And sometimes we imagine life works that way too, right? Life is only this. Right? But there are going to be things in our lives, whether it be Facebook or somewhere along through here, that make us stop and pay attention. It's as though time compresses. And we see more of what's going on in those particular circumstances. Right? What stands out to you? What makes you stop? What, what grabs your attention that you look at longer in your day or in your week? What is that? What do you notice yourself noticing? Stories. What's that? A story where someone shows compassion. Okay, stories of compassion. That's great. Hey, you know what, Jamie? That's on me. I flipped the switch thinking that it was muted. Okay. Sorry about that. What else? What else do you notice in your week? In your I'm yeah. My interests. Yeah. And Facebook's really good at determining what your interests are. Most of us are. Yeah. I mean, if you don't believe this happens, go to Amazon when you're logged in, look at something. And the next time you get on Facebook, that's all you're going to see is advertisements for whatever that was you were looking at. That's true. So if I ever want to buy something for my husband, I can't do that when I'm logged in because when he lurks on mine, he would see <laughs> that, you know, whatever it was I was thinking about buying him. Because he doesn't have his own page, he gets on mine. Oh, that's but, fun. yeah, I mean, so just pay attention because they do do that, and, you know, you don't always realize that. So where else is that happening? It happens all over the place. Sure. I mean, they're, they're zeroed in on what they're going to do to try and get you. Sure. And we zero in. 
on the things that interest us, right? I mean, it's, by nature, that's, that's why we're paying attention to it, because it interests us. Yeah. I, I look for things I'm interested too, but I, sometimes I'll go past something that I know I don't want to look at, and then I go back to see who posted it, mm. whether it's somebody I care about or a stranger. That's interesting. It's interesting. A little sidetrack. Heather, Heather has the same problem I have. Heather and you share the same problem. Well, Belinda gets on and looks at something, and she gets on, and for some reason, she gets on on my Facebook, which she set up because she wanted to try it to see what it was like before she set hers up. Nice. So the next time I check to see what the grandkids are up to, there's something there about women's shoes. Uh, <laughs> but but the, the sidetrack that where I started going in my head was the things that we allow ourselves to be distracted into, pulled into, are going to affect other people. Indeed. Indeed. Oftentimes, those other shiny objects distract us from building the box. Right? And I, I, I'm further convinced more and more that the, the way to, to overthrow a society in this day and age is to not beat them with military might, but to entertain them to death. To literally make it so that they don't care of what is going on in the world. And I think that I think that that's what's happening in many, many cases as we pursue the heavenly kingdom. We get so distracted by this life that we forget that this is not our eternal home. That this is, this is not what it's about. Sure, there's pleasures to be found. There's things to eat. There's things to enjoy. And in many ways... Yeah, God made this place, and so there's going to be a lot of really good things, right? He made it, and what did he say about it when it was all, when, when, when he made mankind, what did he say? Very good. It is very good. So by design, this place has a lot of very good stuff. But when we mess up the perspective, and we mess up, the importance of the different things when we make the creation more important than the creator it all gets messed up pretty bad and so that's why we must rely on the spirit we must recognize what grabs our attention and when we recognize what's grabbing our attention we we must wrestle with then is this glorifying to God? Or maybe how is this glorifying to God? Or how is it not glorifying to God? And what am I called to do because of that answer? Right? We need to continue to let the Spirit teach us and refocus what we see in this life. Right? Because... Things are going to catch your interest. Things are going to catch your eye. Something will. I don't know what the numbers are of what we actually see, but there's much, much, much more going on. There's many, many more things than we, that we see that our mind just says that's not important and doesn't take time to process it. You're seeing something right now, and I'll almost guarantee that none of you are paying attention to it. You ready for this? You're seeing the revolution of that fan blade. And you're not paying attention, are you? You hear it. You, you actually see it flipping around like crazy. I don't know how many revolutions per minute that's making. Overall, I feel that, like, that's cooling me off. It feels good. I enjoy it. But even that, like, I've had to slow down 
actually draw my attention to it and think about the benefits of what the fan's doing in life. But for most of us, who cares? It's hot, the fan's on, that's a good thing. I'm not going to think about it much more than that. There's birds that sing every day that often we won't even hear or we won't even process because there's more important things that our mind is processing, right? There's going to be many, many, many things that we see that we don't process through because there's more important things. And we have to, we have to wrestle with what is more important and how do we set the things that God's asking us to wrestle with up higher on the list. Not just from a, oh, I need to manage my behavior better. This is a, how do I mature in being who God wants me to be better? Right? Let's flip to Colossians for a second. And I know that, like, we are, we're talking about heaven. And yet, that's the series that we're in, is a, a series on heaven, right? And yet, we're talking about the Spirit in this life, and even today, it's the, the tagline, the title, if you will, of this chapter in my Bible says, Rules for Holy Living, for this passage. It's Colossians chapter 3. Now, why do you suppose we're talking about earthly things as we deal with heaven? What we do does uh, it does affect our experience in heaven. You're right. Yep, this is going to be like heaven comes down to earth. God makes his dwelling among us as he restores and makes a, a new heaven and new earth. And we're going we'll, we're to be talking about that. All right? How we go about living this life now, though, affects what we understand and what we're going to be focusing on as we learn about heaven. So we've got to be able to click through the lenses so that we're seeing appropriately Otherwise, we get this, we get this uh, misaligned vision of what heaven is, not because of our um, lack of ability to understand, but because of our desire of making, of, of us wanting to make heaven what we want it to be, instead of allowing heaven to show us what it is, right? And we're going to experience that. I just... Peggy and I and, and Jamie were talking about that this morning. If you've been reading the passages, Jamie, do you have that? We're going to, can you put up the passages that we need to be reading? Some of you may have read this last week and said, oh my gosh, that's a lot of passages we need to read this week. Right? It is a lot of passages. I've got good news if you didn't read them yet. Those passages are passages we're going to be talking about in consecutive weeks. We'd like for you to be reading them so that you're familiar with them. We can talk about them in a way that this is not the first time recently that you've heard them or read them, okay? But as we, as we wrestle through what some of these passages are, as we deal with, with what the Spirit is revealing to us, we have to have a, a, quote, correct perspective of what this looks like. Otherwise, we, we do what we experienced this morning with, with Peggy and Jamie and I of, we read a passage that has a physical description of something and we make it what we want it to be instead of allowing it to reveal what it is, right? If I tell you that there's a blue ball in the room, how big, the, the first question that we all have to wrestle with is how big is the ball, right? What, what shade of blue? Does it bounce? Or is it like a bowling ball? I mean, there's loads and loads of details that we automatically insert into a, a given description. So as we learn about heaven, we have to gain a, a, a perspective or understanding of what, that, what the, the correct version of that may be. All right? Colossians helps us gain some of this. Right? Since then, 
You have been raised with Christ. This is Colossians 3 again, starting in verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ, in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. That seems a little intense, doesn't it? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. What a list. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. How many of you have ever wanted to get even with someone? Most of us have probably experienced this, right? Now, if we're to do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus, there are times where we feel as though it's our place to... Bestow justice, right? To do what God says would need to be done. And we want to be his arm, his mighty arm, to administer that uh, correctional activity, if you will. That's right. We want Old Testament justice, as long as we're the administer. But hey... If it's coming our way, then let's talk about grace, right? Let's be a little bit more forgiving. There's some parts in this passage that, well, shoot, all of this passage, there's a lot of difficult and heavy things to deal with. There's things in here that I got to believe that most of us are still wrestling with, right? Right? As we look at what heaven is going to be like, we also must hold in tension how it is we're living today in order that we begin to align our lives in a way that prepares for God's kingdom. We, we must wrestle through some refining and we must wrestle through some growth, right? I've told you that I've, I like watching Forged in Fire. One of my favorite things is when they're, uh, they're, they're forge welding, which is when they get things almost to the point of 
They get the steel almost to a point of being a liquid, and then they smash the living daylights out of it so that it all welds together, right? Instead of running a bunch of extra material into it, they get it super hot, and they, they smash the stuff together. There's a lot that goes into to iron working, though, and the, the whole thing of, of working through this stuff. And refining is hard. It's hot. There's pressure involved. And things get removed. Right? That's the whole point of refining is to remove stuff. If you had to think, think about something you're wearing right now. One of the pieces of clothing or jewelry or something that you're wearing right now. You got it? Would you pay more or less for the fabric that it's made of? You're just going to go to Walmart or to Joanne Fabrics or somewhere. You're going to buy just the fabric to make it. Are you, going to, are you willing to pay more or less than what you paid for the, the article or the, the item of clothing or jewelry? What do you think? You'd pay, you're not willing to pay more. You'd pay less. Okay? So did, Crystal, did you say more? Less? What's that? Okay, you're going to have to put your own work into it. Yeah. It's interesting that even though you're going to have more fabric or more gold or whatever it is, you're going to have more of something. You expect to pay less because it's not, it's not the item yet. There's still work to be done, right? Your shirt has more holes. Your pants have more holes in them now. There's less fabric than to buy it, yet we're willing to pay more because you can put it on. Right? That's this whole idea of how refining actually increases the value even though it decreases the contents. The same is true of our lives. Sometimes we think that the only way to increase value is to increase content or possession. When in reality, we increase value by getting rid of things. And the whole first part of this this passage, now, 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 now. We are talking about getting rid of things, but coffee is probably not one of them. Whew, that's, that was close. That was close. I don't think it's scriptural, but, you know, thou shalt not throw away coffee is prob- probably should be a thing. It says put to death. Now, if you're going to kill something, if you're going to put something to death, what does that take? Okay, you're going to need a real weapon a certain measure of strength. Yeah, you got to make sure it gets done. Isaac has been watching some hunting shows, right? He likes watching hunting shows. And the one show that I caught part of, I, I walk in and literally I see a moose or an elk or something, getting up as the hunter was right there ready to like make sure it was dead type thing. Now, if you thought you've killed something, especially something that big, did it tell you how big the thing was? Yeah, it, was cha- it started chasing him. You know, if you just shoot me and you didn't kill me, then I'm going to probably chase you. If, if, if I can pull... I, if my, literally, at that point in time, I know my life depends on it, I'm willing to do a lot more than normal, right? I'm not just going to try and kind of get away or try and kind of come beat you up. I'm either going to get away or I'm going to beat you up. Those are the, really the two options that go through my head, right? Well, this, this animal had just been shot, the guy thought it was dead. He walked up to it. He's, I don't know, maybe five, six feet away. When the thing gets up, and its big old antlers are right there, and it's like, chasing after this guy, and he's freaking out. I got to believe most of us would. 
because he thought it was dead and it wasn't. Right? And it, the matter got resolved not because he was skillful in escaping or he drew another weapon and shot it or anything else, but because his friend, his hunting partner, drew up his weapon and put another bullet in the thing. There are going to be times when, as we're told, put this to death, that we try to do that very thing. We're going to simply go through our human efforts and our, I'm done with this. I'm going to do this. Right? And there are going to be days when we think we've got it done. When we think we've, we've put this to death. And lo and behold, something shows up in this list. And it rears its head. It rears up and comes to attack us. Why? Because we're trying to kill it. When you're trying to kill something, it often doesn't like being trying to kill. Try to, try to, try to be dead. Yeah, whatever that is. However you say that. It doesn't like it. I don't want to die. Nothing does. Nothing wants to die, and it certainly doesn't go willingly. All right? The things in this list, they don't go away easy. And there may be days when you need someone else to put a bullet in the thing. There are going to be times when you may be doing something, and because of love for one another, we need to say, you need to check what you're doing here. You need to watch and, and see what it is that's taking place. Because these types of things, especially when you try to kill them, they will attack you with fury. None of these go down willingly. They may lie in wait for you to come close, and then they're going to try and chew you up. So as we look at this list from the, from the first part of this, this chapter... Whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Well, that pretty well sums it up, right? He goes into detail a little bit. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Do you leave anything out? I think you pretty well spelled it out with the first part of that, of, of uh, you know, your, your earthly nature, your selfishness, if you will. But then he spells out some more. You must rid yourselves of all these things, such as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. Don't lie, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self. And then he says this whole stuff about there's no distinction, there's no separation, there's no identifiers that matter except Christ. We have to put ourselves to death, oftentimes daily, many times hourly, maybe even moment by moment. We have to re-put ourselves to death that we may do what Christ wants us to do. And that's tough. It's hard work. But it's worth it. How many families in our culture have clothing lines, do you know? There aren't. But boy, the ones that do, like there are some families that they, and there are still some today I suppose that, that try to like make a name for themselves to say I have this cool clothing line, right? Well we have a clothing line as a family. Did you know that? We have our own clothing line. It sounds like this. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I don't know what our logo is. <laughs> Fish, the cross, there, there's probably several options. But that's the mark. That's the attire of our family. It's what we wear. You will know when you recognize, or you'll, you'll know 
what it looks like when someone has compassion, when someone has kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It's fairly, in, in, in many cases today, it's fairly uncommon. But that's what we're called to wear. That's what's called to be in our, our dressers, if you will. As we continue to, to look toward heaven, it's probably worth a look in our, our spiritual dressers, if you will, of what are we wearing? What's our clothing look like? Are there rags of anger and malice? Are there socks that have some holes in them that would have been remnants of sexual immorality or impurity? What are your, what, what's, your, what's your clothing look like? What are you wearing? Are we wearing things that promote ourselves? Are we wearing things that promote Christ? Because the things that promote ourselves can't enter heaven. Can't go there. So God is holy. There will be nothing unholy in His presence. It's why the work of Jesus is so important because it allows us that same access. It allows us to be in His presence because he redeemed us. He washed us. He cleaned us. That we may be there even though we've had unholiness with us, in us, on us. But he's fixed that. And the question becomes, why would we put it back on? Why would you want to wear some of these things? Why would you want to behave in some of these other ways? When we've got ways of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I can tell you why sometimes I want to go back to those other ones. You know why? Because they're easier. It's easier for me to be angry and act out in anger and rage than it is for me to show gentleness and compassion. It's easier for me at times to simply want to be the arm of God's justice and administer even in anger than to show patience and forgiveness. Doesn't make it right. In fact, I'm pretty sure this says it makes it wrong. And that's something I need to work on. That's something we all need to work on. If we're wearing certain parts of this attire that need to be put to death. I mean, sometimes it's hard for some of us to throw clothing away, right? Especially if it's a, still a nice shirt. Oh, that still has the tags on it. That's, that's, a, that's great. That's my favorite. It's my favorite sweater, my favorite jacket, my favorite necklace, my favorite hairpiece, whatever it may be. Put it to death. Shoot it. Burn it. Throw it away. Do whatever you've got to do to get that sucker gone. It's hard. Yet we're called to do so, and we're called to live into this life as God's chosen people to show compassion, kindness, gentleness, the Spirit's going to direct us. He's going to help us. But we've got to be willing to let Him work. And that's hard. I like your clothing analogy. If I, instead of picture... It's not mine. It's in here. <laughs> I know, but I've always thought of it as part of character and not as clothing I wore. And when you were talking, picturing it as clothing, what I was picturing was... Some, Clothing that had become really gross, whether from vomit or pee or being dumped in a sewer or whatever. You know, so if, if I take things that I might look at as being new or still in good condition and I start looking at it like that, I mean, that just turns my stomach the thought of putting it on. Sure. Make it a whole lot easier to say, I don't want that. Yeah. Uh -uh. 
Yeah, who wants to wear a shirt that's just been vomited on? Anyone? <laughs> Yummy! Some of us have looked at other people's shirts and says, why are you wearing vomit? <laughs> why would you wear that? Yeah. Or do you have a twitch? I no. One of the things that I thought of when you were talking about this, about clothing yourself in compassion and kindness, humility, and is that I think sometimes it's easier to be vengeful and angry because you don't, I, I don't, I shouldn't say you, I don't feel like I die to myself. But if I have to be compassionate and merciful and humble and, you know, of what sort, that's kind of ha like you have to be willing to bow to the other person's need almost. I don't know. That sounds terribly selfish, but I kind of feel like that's where I landed on that. That's fair. It, we have to. We have to put ourselves to death. And the tough part about this, one of the, one of the hardest things about being compassionate, wearing compassion and kindness and gentleness and humility, one of the hardest things about that is we often have to do it when the other person is wearing anger and rage and impurity and lust and selfishness, whatever that may be. They haven't put themselves to death yet, and yet we have to. What the crap is that all about? It doesn't seem fair, does it? What in the world? But when we begin to see how great of a clothing line God has given us, It may be difficult at times to start wearing it, but when you see the wearability of it, to see the benefits of what it looks like to wear this family clothing line that we have, to know that someone can literally throw up on you. I mean, that's what it feels like sometimes, right? Someone's literally just throwing up on you, or they're, they're shooting you with, with uh, food during a food fight or any number of things, and to be able to, to simply... Take the clothes, wash them, and see them come out as clean as they come. To know that someone can throw scissors or a knife or something at you, and it doesn't rip or tear. It may hurt. I mean, you get hit in a, with a bulletproof vest by a bullet, the bullet's going to stop, but it's still going to hurt. Well, the thing about all of this is you, you have to go back to Christ because I have to have Christ's compassion, Christ's kindness, Christ's humility, Indeed. Christ's gentleness because I have a worldly interpretation or worldly, you know, I can say, okay, this is what compassion is in the world's eyes. And I want compassion, which may mean somebody else suffers from it, but I don't care. You're right. And so all of these things, because if there's one thing that convinces me that resurrection is true, <laughs> it's how fast the old man gets resurrected. Indeed. And so anger and malice and all of this stuff is right there all the time, which is why we need the, the fellow with us with the help us out. When we've missed the mark, yeah. there's someone else there who will help us get back on track. You're absolutely right. And uh, so this line of clothing is hard to wear. Can be. And we need not only Christ continually with us to wear them well, but we also need the family of God around us to help us make sure that our slip isn't showing. It's true. If you could just pass it back. Thank you. Thank you, Dewey. Um, I was thinking, too, when you mentioned a new garment, mm -hmm. and what if I'm not that size? It, I need to be right size in order to renew my mind. If I'm walking in arrogance or belligerence, I'm not going to be able to renew my mind because I will not accept the word 
Does that make sense? It does. So I need to be right size, and all that is within. God gave us freedom of will to choose to die, as you said, to self, and that's true. Choose. We just did back to school shopping for our children because they've got lots of things at Walmart that are on on sale. Right? We picked up some pants for the girls for two dollars a piece. I was very happy about that. Right? One of the things I noticed was Walmart has a lot of sizes. It's like everything from toddlers, probably even like you could probably even find some stuff that four pounds or more, they have a size for it, I think. It's it's ridiculous how small some of the clothing is. Especially now, it's like, our kids were never this small, right? If you're a parent, you've always thought that. Or sometime have thought that, anyway. And then they go up to, I, I saw some shirts on clearance for me, and I'm like, that, I could, I could wear something like that. And I checked the size, and it's like 5X or something like that. It's huge. I'm like, oh my word, <laughs> like that's, that's too big for my father-in-law. And I love my father-in-law, and if he's listening, then just know that I love you, Dad. But, like, that thing was huge. And our Heavenly Father is a wonderful tailor. And this clothing line that he has given us of gentleness and compassion, there's a size for each and every one of us. Absolutely a size for each and every one of us. We can't. We can't not do these things because we don't feel as though there's a size for us. At the same time, we can't stop growing in these things because we feel as though there won't be the next size up for us. Right? My children, I've had to refine my shoes occasionally. Not because I've misplaced them. Or they're not where I took them off, but because they put them on and then wear them around the house and take them off and leave them wherever it is they leave them. Right? Now, do you imagine that my shoes fit my children very well? No, they don't. Not yet. Isaac is getting close. And there will be a day when he will probably grow into my shoes, literally, that he could wear my shoes. And they're... Each and every one of us have clothes that look like these things. We have compassion. We have humility. We have patience. Oh, my goodness. We've seen the, the, the picture. Some of us have seen the picture that says, God, please give me patience. Not opportunities to learn it. Not this, this whole get this idea of you know, more patience. Not this time. No, I need patience. Just bestow it to me, for heaven's sakes. Stop. But there's, there's clothes that God already has prepared for us that are bigger than what we can currently wear. He's already prepared it. He's got them ready, and He wants us to grow into that. That we may be who He's made us already to be. It's already in us. We just have to get rid of the other stuff that's there. Because it doesn't, it doesn't fit. Now, if something doesn't fit, it either means it's too big or too small, right? Now, we've worked through some of the stuff of saying how there's things we need to get rid of. There are some things that some of us can't fit because there's too much here. Or there's too much here. Or here. Any, any number of places. Sometimes it doesn't fit because there's too much. And if there's too much, we've got to get rid of some stuff. If there's too small, maybe it involves some work yet. Maybe it involves some growth. Regardless of what the case may be, whether it's too big or too small, God's inviting us to grow into the, the clothing that He's already made for us. He's got it ready. And He's got the intermediate sizes ready for us too, that we can continue to be clothed while we're growing into who He wants us to be. All of this matters to help us gain perspective as we head toward heaven, that we can understand what He has made 
Not from how we want it to be, but how he's made it to be. I have some questions. You, you want to, you still got something? Okay. <laughs> A lot of this goes back to what I've talked about before, and I'm working on it with myself, meditating on who we are, because we've been created in God's image. He made us a new creation. Indeed. And if I keep thinking about that, I'm going to act that way more. Whereas if I keep thinking about the old man, I know I need to get rid of him. But if I keep thinking about him, I'm going to react like him more. And if I go into the closet to put on clothes, if I don't see myself as a child of the king, I'm not going to be comfortable wearing kingly royal garments. I'm going to want to put on the peasant's clothing, the old stuff. Yep. And I don't want to. And that's exactly the case that we're facing. That's literally, we've got a royal clothing line. Right. That's amazing to think about. I have some questions that I need us to wrestle with the next week. All right? I don't have these written down. I didn't even give them to Jamie to put up on a slide. So some way that you can record these. You ready? There's four questions, and you may need to think about these more than once, maybe even more than once a day. What are you wearing? It's the first question. What are you wearing? And think back to the context of what this passage is talking about. Are you wearing the peasant's clothes, the anger, the malice, the sexual immorality, impurity, lust? Are you wearing that? Or are you wearing gentleness? Kindness, compassion, forgiveness. What are you wearing? Who are you having a hard time with? Seems like a strange question. Some of us already had someone come to mind by name. Other of us, maybe just a people group. But when you're around this person who you're having a hard time with, you need to be sure you're wearing the right clothes, okay? Or if you know you're going to encounter this person, maybe take an extra change of clothes in case you have to deal with some stuff. Who are you having a hard time with? What does it look like for you to love them this week? We didn't talk about this much, but one of, the, or one of the things that Paul tells the church is to be thankful. Just a really short sentence that he says. And be thankful. Goodness, we've met plenty of people that aren't, haven't we? We've been that person sometimes. Be thankful. So the last question is, which one do you, which one do you have last, Peggy? What does it look like for me to love them well, the person you're having a hard time with? And then I'd like for us to reflect on what do I have to be thankful for? We're all, most of us are pretty skilled at finding the things that we are frustrated with or that make us upset, that bring rage, malice, whatever kind of thoughts may arise. Many of us are good at finding those things. Most of us probably struggle with being thankful. The church, the Colossians struggled with this too. I think that's why Paul tells them. He's not telling them to encourage them further. I think he's telling them because they were struggling with it. Be thankful. Right? I say it so meanly. Be thankful. We have reason to be thankful. Let's... Let's be thankful. Not just recipients of why we can be thankful. Let's be thankful. What do we have to be thankful for? And the last is an activity that we need to keep in mind. The last thing here is the way by which we do things. Okay? The way by which we do any and everything. It's going to help us want to wear the right clothes. Because if we're in the wrong clothes, this is going to look really funny. All right? We're told at the end, verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, whether you're talking or doing, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
giving thanks to God the Father through him. This looks really funny if we're doing something in the name of Jesus that's of the wrong clothing line. Okay? We can say that we're doing this in the name of Jesus, but it's not glorifying to him. It's not edifying to us. It, it just makes a mess and confuses people. Okay? So consider what you're wearing, who you're having a hard time with, how do you love them well, what do you have to be thankful for, and everything that we do this week, may we do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do it all for him. Okay? Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the clothing line you've given us. Lord, we ask that you help us wear it well. Lord, in the areas that it's too tight, we ask that you help us lose the pounds, lose the, lose the space, whatever it may need. Whatever's taking up that, that area, we ask that, that you help us lose it. And you help us put it to death. Not even lose it so we can find it again. Help us put that sucker to death. And Lord, we pray that you help us to, to follow you well. To look at this world, broken yet redeemed, in a way that says we want to join you in reclaiming it all for your name, for your glory. Lord, help us go well to do your will, to bring glory to you, be in your family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go forth to love and serve the Lord. Have a great week.